he's working. <laughs> so, hello, I think we're going to start now, if that's all right. So, just um, hello um, and welcome to the Royal College of Art and welcome to the last Visual Cultures Lecture of the series of 2014. And we're really pleased and very privileged to welcome Thomas Herschel in here tonight to talk. Um, I'm going to say a few words about that. Um, Swiss-born artist Thomas Herschel creates mixed media installations, often using everyday materials such as cardboard, foil and duct tape, juxtaposed with found imagery. Herschel previously worked in a group of political graphic artists in the 1980s Paris, which influenced his use of common materials as a political statement. With each exhibition in museums, galleries, alternative spaces, as well as with specific works in public space, Thomas Herschel asserts his commitment toward a non-exclusive public. Herschel's work has been shown in numerous museums, galleries and group exhibitions, including the Venice Biennale in 1999, Documenta 11 in 2002, the 27th Sao Paulo Biennale in 2006, the 55th Carnegie International Pittsburgh in 2008, Swiss Pavilion at the 54th Venice Biennale. This becomes a long list of these things. Um, as, and a selection of his writing has recently been published by MIT Press, October Books, um, called Critical Laboratory, The Writings of Thomas Hershorn. As some of you might already know, the Visual Cultures Lecture Series looks closely at current modes of artistic production, and we ask our guests to present and explore a single work Thomas Hirschhorn has chosen to focus on his Gramsci Monument project commissioned by the Dare Art Foundation in 2013. From July to September the 15th, 2013, Gramsci Monument was open seven days a week on the grounds of Forest Houses, a New York City Housing Authority development in the Morisana neighborhood of the New York City borough of the Bronx. And this is what I'm going to say about it. Gramsci Monument is a fourth in the series of monuments dedicated to philosophers. Hirschhorn has made monuments previously to Battelle, Spinoza, Bataille, Spinoza and Deleuze. If post-structuralist interpretations of Spinoza and Gramsci focus upon discourse and language and practice and action is viewed through intertextuality and an aestheticised idea of life, what I think Thomas Hirschhorn does to these thinkers in the monument project is to position them within the social and material world, publishing them and arranging them to be engaged with and communicated through. Hirschhorn's monument reminds us of the materiality of all of these processes, especially when thinking about it, about what it means to practice in a politicised manner, and therefore about how practice can produce a new way of thinking about the materiality of life and of the materiality of art. So I take no more time, <laughs> me talking, and I welcome Thomas Hirschhorn to talk about the Gramsci Project. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much, Melanie, for this introduction. I would like to thank to the Royal, the Royal College to <laughs> for inviting me to come to London and to especially to Anka, but also to Anne, who took over this commitment and made this possible. So today, about uh, the Gramsci Monument, this lecture wants to share with you uh, the experience I did last year in, uh, in New York. It was an experience, uh, sometimes difficult, sometimes fun, but uh, in every case a very strong experience. I learned a lot in doing this artwork. I learned what it means to work within a community. I learned what it means to work with people who have a very strong dignity. I learned what it means to uh, stand out failures and lakes and how to agree with them. I learned uh, what it means uh, to be critical, to be skeptical or to have doubts. And uh, 
I learned how um, to work with people in a neighborhood uh, who share the same thinking of total equality with me. So this experience, uh, the Gramsci monument, was an experience I, I could do because I wanted to do a monument. I wanted to do a new kind of monument, a new kind of monument in relation to the location where it is. I don't hope, Scott, you have to fly down. <laughs> Sorry. So a new kind of monument related to the location where I put it, to to whom it is dedicated, to the duration, because it's only for summertime, and of course, uh, a new kind of monument, because what is the output of it? This was my, my goal, to, to establish a new kind of monument with these four, uh, with these four elements, and I will come later to the four of them. I don't know why this don't want let me do this. So this is the first monument I did. It's called the Spinoza Monument, I did it in Amsterdam in 1999. It was the, mo the smallest of the monuments, a quite a, a compact monument. It was in the red light districts in Amsterdam. In this monument, I didn't need any, um, any interaction of somebody who lives here. The only uh, contact I need was the whom who gave me the electricity. In the second monument, the Deleuze monument I made in 2000, I, I wanted to go a step forward and I did it uh, in a suburb of Avignon. It was in a group exhibition called La Beauté and I wanted to do it where people are living with people who lives there. So it was in a neighborhood of uh, uh, HLM, means a kind of public housing neighborhood um, I constructed it together with the neighbors, but um, I forget to think on how the monument will go through the whole period of the, of the exhibition experience. So I had, after a few weeks, to stop the experience because it doesn't make any sense more. I learned from this experience, and I invited then uh, something I called presence and production, because I thought when I do a project together with residents of a public housing, I need myself, the artist, to be there all the time and to be the whom who takes care about my work. That is why the third of the monuments here in Kassel 2002, I made it with this guideline presence and production. Since the beginning, I wanted to do four monuments. I wanted to do uh, a monument also for Antonio Gramsci. I decided it in the beginning. I decided it because I love his life and I love his work. Antonio Gramsci is a Marxist, Marxist thinker and a philosopher 
who was his, in his short life, his 11 last years in prison. This changed a lot for him because he wanted to be a practitioner, but he couldn't in the prison. So he had to change his strategy and he started to write. And he wrote beautiful prison notebooks in school books. And I like this writing very much because it's a very open, non-dogmatic writing. He wrote about a lot of subjects what I, what I think they make sense today. That's why, since the beginning, I wanted to do a monument dedicated to Antonio Gramsci. To me, um, I want to work in a form and force field of love, politics, aesthetics, and philosophy. All my work I put has to touch this form and force field. Love, politics, philosophy, and aesthetics. Not equally, but I want in all of my work that there, these four form and force field, like I call them, are touched. So, to me, then it makes sense to, in, to do a monument to Spinoza, Deleuze, Bataille, and Gramsci. And I made this drawing to explain it. Because, to me, uh, Spinoza, I situate myself in the interface between love and philosophy. Deleuze, between philosophy and aesthetics. I remember, for example, the fantastic uh, book uh, Thousand Plateau, which is for me as an artist, a very important tool. Then uh, I put Bataille in the interface between politics and aesthetics. I remind the interest Bataille had to art, to the surrealists, but also politics, because what I love in Bataille is his thinking about potlatch, about expenditure, about the notion of depends. And then, finally, Gramsci in the interface between love and politics. So that's why there are four philosophers I wanted to do a monument of, and that's why there are not five or not three. Of course, uh, to do a work like the Gramsci monument needs um, ambition. The artistic ambition was to establish, to establish a new term of monument, as I told you, with these four elements. Then I wanted to provoke encounters. I wanted to create an event. And I wanted to thri think Gramsci today. This, is, this was the ambition of the Gramsci monument. This is also the ambition of the other monuments, of course not Gramsci, but Deleuze, Spinoza, Bataille. I am, as an artist, interested in philosophy. I love philosophy, as I love art. To me, I made this map together with my friend, Markus Steinweg, philosopher, to me, between art and philosophy, there is a friendship. And we put this logo of the handshake. This is the expression of this friendship. We share together hope, form, assertion, headlessness, courage, universality, resistance, autonomy, love, and war. These ter 10 terms stand for the ten fingers who touch when you shake hands. The idea is, our idea is, Marcus and my idea is, not to say this is a part of philosophy and this is a part of art. No, we share them together completely. For example, of course, assertion. The art is the assertion of form, and the philosopher is an assertion of a concept. So this map helps me always to be focused not only on art, but also on what can, ha what can be an issue for philosophy. 
my work, Gramsci Monument, I wanted to do it in a kind of meaning of a mission. This mission, I wanted to do it in friendship. I wanted to do it in the total belief in equality. And I wanted to do it believing that art must, can touch the other. I made this drawing. Melanie just mentioned the non-exclusive audience for to be clear what I mean with the other. I think, as the artist, I think I need to direct my work to the other, to the non-exclusive audience. The whom who is not interested in art, the whom who is the neighbor, the whom who is the stranger, the whom I don't know, the whom who has other problems than art. I think this must be the direction. What comes back is a judgment of what I'm doing. I think this is precious. On the other side, you see, and I believe the artist has not to direct his work to what I call the specter of evaluation, the institution director, the art critic, the curator, the gallerist, the art historian, the collector, the art professor. The artist has not to direct the work to them. But of course, because it's a non-exclusive audience, they are not excluded because they are part of the other. That's why they're touching. This is a schema I bring with me, I share with me, I carry with me. The spectrum of evaluation, evaluation is also because, not interesting for the artists, because they are ev evaluating the work. They're not judging it. They're only evaluating it. But you can only progress when your work is judged. So that's why I think it is important to me uh, to direct it to the non-exclusive audience, to the other. Art to me has, is a resistance, is resistance as such. Art has the power of transformation. Art, I think, can create a condition for implication. Art is based, I think, on autonomy. Autonomy is another word for beauty, for example, and art is based on universality, and other words are justice or equality. And of course, I think art can establish a dialogue or a confrontation one to one. I made years ago this schema, where do I stand, what do I want, because I think it's important as an artist. I don't want to go into details, only in the middle, on the bottom, on the, in the middle. And Melanie again already mentioned it. I, from the beginning, I wrote down, I want to work in the museum, in the gallery, and in the public space. This is a, a commitment I took from the beginning. It's very important to me as an artist, uh, not only to work in one field of uh, confrontation of art, but also in all kinds of fields where it is possible. So also in the public space. I do this also to be truthful to the artists I love who did it in the past. That's why to me it's important to work and to do also project in public space. So before I started with the Gramsci monument, I made this timeline, timeline work in public space. And I wanted to look back and to look forward uh, to make a, a fixer, a fixture, a, a fixture point about all projects I did in public space so far. There are 62. They are small, it's very small projects sometimes, and also bigger ones. Uh, but I wanted to make it and to give a form to this, uh, only these projects in public space to make clear that to me uh, there is a specificity to work in public space, and I will come on this later. This was exhibited in an exhibition space at DIA. DIA is 
the institution who invited me to do the Gramsci monument. It was, to me as an artist, a fantastic experience to work with Dia. First of all, of course, because the background they have, the knowledge they have, but also the commitment they have from the director to the curator to the to the uh, to the person uh, on the front desk. Everybody was completely committed to my project, and it's very important because a project so complex, sometimes so difficult, sometimes so fun also, like the Gramsci monument, you can only do with a partner who is very strong. So I was very happy that I can, could do it with the Dia Art Foundation. So the work started two and a half years before when they invited me to do something in public space. It started first with researches about Gramsci in Rome, in Sicilia, where he lived, um, and in other places. But then, of course, one of the most important, one of the most important work I call is the field work. The field work, which is important to me, and here I want to come back to what I said about a new kind of monument, because it's about the location. Because when you are invited to do a work in public space, what is the big difference? You can decide yourself where to put the artwork. It's not in the upper gallery or in the east uh, level, or it's in the big gallery or in the lower gallery. It is up to you to decide. And this is a part, very important part of work in public space. Uh, where the artwork is situated, because it says a lot. So this was the starting point for my Gramsci monument. This is the map of New York City housing, the public housings in New York City. There are, about, there are now more than 300 public housings in New York City. There are four, four, more than 400,000 New Yorkers living in public housing. And there are about 300,000 people who are waiting in New York City for a public housing. So um, I started uh, with this map. And this was my map for one and a half year when I did field work. I went, visited 47 uh, different public housings in Brooklyn, in Staten Island, in Manhattan, uh, in the Bronx, and in Queens, in all of the five boroughs. In the beginning, I just went there to have a look, to make some photos about the architecture. Um, and then, uh, with the time, with several times, I went to New York nine times, with several times, I, I must, I must, must it, of course, uh, decide once where I could do the Gramsci monument. And actually, this is a, a map of forest houses, where it was, the Gramsci monument. So the question of the location is, of course, a very important question. But of course, it's not the question of the architecture or of the layout. It's the question of the people of to meet somebody. So actually for one and a half years, I was visiting public housing in order to meet somebody who could do it with me. Uh, on the le le left side, we see Diane Herbert, and on the right side, Clyde Thompson. For the Gramsci monument, very important persons. Because on one of my trips in the Bronx, I met Diane and I met Clyde. They are working uh, in the community center at Forest Houses. Uh, and I had a very nice discussion with them about my project, about what I wanted to do. It was not the only persons I met. I met about 20 persons in different uh, neighborhoods. But what I personally liked a lot was uh, the challenging questions they had to me. Uh, every, every day after these field works, 
I made a small debrief, which I sent to the curator of DIA. And this is the debrief I found about the first meeting I had. So this was the first very fragile meeting, but immediately I, I thought, I felt there was, there was a contact. There was a contact, there was a, an opening, there was a possibility together with uh, uh, Diane and with Clyde, which I met for four, five, six times after, always uh, trying um, to engage the dialogue about my project. And they were interested. And once um, Clyde told me, I will present you somebody in the neighborhood. And this man, his name is Eric Farmer. He's the president of the residence in the neighborhood uh, Forest Houses. And it was a very nice meeting because Eric uh, immediately uh, asked me a lot of questions about my project. And he also, um, was the only person who asked me about Antonio Gramsci and could I lend him a book. So this was a very nice moment to meet somebody really um, um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a level which you could, you could imagine that there is a continuum. I brought with me, I carry with me on all these meetings a map I made, a big map. I wanted to, with this big map, uh, uh, explain to the people the complexity, but also the necessity for me of this project. Clyde, together with Eric, then uh, um, proposed me to open up um, my proposal more to the people, the, the people in the neighborhood. And here, this is one of the meeting we had in the local um, community center, in the gym of the local community center, where I tried to explain my project to the residents. I made also uh, uh, field trips uh, on, the f on the ground here with Mrs. Burke and Mrs. Salters. Uh, the first, the first residents uh, which, uh, which welcomed me at Forest Houses and uh, was inter interested, interested in my project there. Um, the question of location is based, of course, of people, of encounter with people, of somebody who will let you do, or even more, propose you to do it there. The question of the spot, the specific spot, where it is, you know, the specific spot is a qu another question who arrives later, who will arise always later, six months later in the winter 2012, 2013, on another site visit, uh, Mrs. Salters and Mrs. Burke uh, showed me the places and told me, uh, had some ideas where I could put my artwork. And uh, this was very helpful to have this kind of feedback from, from real residents. Um, that's why the Gramsci monument is there where it was, because these few uh, meetings uh, on the ground, and also, of course, because I could, with several meetings with Clyde, with Diane, and with Eric Farmer, I could have a kind of, uh, uh, create a kind of uh, connection based on confidence. What I did, I went there and told to the people, I, I need your help. This is the cornerstone. I need your help. Not me, the artist, will help you, can help you. Or not me, the artist, thinks I can help you. I asked them, can you help me to do the work? This was the cornerstone. This is a little bit difficult, but also it's something 
which I think is very important, that I ask for help. Because without the help of the people there, I could not do the Gramsci monument. So Eric Farmer understood this immediately. He understood, and he understood that uh, uh, to ask for help is something who, who is not, um, who is not um, uh, strange, stranger to him. So Eric was the person who told me once, Thomas, do it here. I will help you. We will help you. We will help you to do your artwork here. So this was, as always, a very important moment when somebody told you, yes, we will help you to do what you want to do. We will help you. This is a picture of Eric, who was very involved all the time after. He was there every day. He was participating. He has, uh, in, the, in, the, in the words of Gramsci, he is an organic intellectual, not only because he's the president of the residence, but he lives there since 40 years. He has a history. His family is there. He has a charisma. He's a leader. And I was very happy that I could meet Eric, who, uh, who understood uh, that this project could be something who could get an interest to the inhabitants. And I was also very happy when I could help him um, as a partner. The Gramsci Monument was also partner in different, in different uh, things Eric, as the president of the residence, did organize. So I asked Eric to, to constitute a team of 15 people to do the construction. And he did. He asked 15 residents to help to the construction, paid for their work, of course. So this is uh, a, a small drawing. I didn't get not a lot into details. It was very simple. There was a platform, there were pavilions, there was a bridge to link the two parts together, and there was a, a pool with a fountain. In seven weeks, together with, this, with the 15 residents, we built uh, the Gramsci monument. Every day there was a briefing and a debriefing in the evening, and we tried uh, to, to very simply and um, uh, very practically to, to follow and to fix the tasks we had to do every day. The, this is the end drawing in the end with it in the end you see the two structures with the ramps with the bridge and with the pavilions the last week a local graffiti artist group came and uh, wanted to intervent and i was very happy because they uh, they did um, make graffitis and stuff on on the uh, gramsci monument here you see um, the, the, the finished bridge. This bridge was necessary because there was two parts, one uh, on the part green grass and the other part on the part diamond, and the bridge did link them together. Important was to have access. That's why there was stairs and ramps. Important was uh, pavilions to host the activities. Uh, there was a, a pool with water, and there was the platform to host all the production we did. This was the, the idea of uh, the Gramsci Monument, the construction of the Gramsci Monument. Uh, the Gramsci Monument was based on two guidelines. I tell them, I 
their guidelines, presence, and production. As I told before, I learned from the other monuments uh, that it is important to be present all the time and to produce something. And I wanted not only myself to be present uh, and to produce. I don't want to be present as the artist, is to be present to, to share the time and to invite the other to share the time with me. That's why it is important to be present and to produce. And also the terms are important to me because my project is not an educational art project. It's not an aesthetical relational art project or a community art project. It's based what I can do to be present and to produce. So now I will tell, I will show you what was the presence. The presence was not only personal, but also, of course, there was structure. So one was the Gramsci archive. The Gramsci archive was a construction with 500 books from uh, the Kamet collection, actually, in New York City, in the Calandra Italian American Society. They have more than 5,000 books from the Kamet. Kamet was a professor at Cooney, and uh, a lot of books are from and about Gramsci. So I could ask them, I asked uh, the, this uh, um, Italian American society to, to give me the books, to lend me the books, and they were agreed. So the books came from Cooney University, to 500 of the books came from Cooney University to the Gramsci monument. The, the books was there to consult for free. Some pictures from this archive space. It was also a space to meet, to discuss, to hang around. And uh, our ambassador, I will come back after, had the idea um, to, uh, to buy everyday apples, the Gramsci apple, we called him, uh, to keep consumption away and everybody could take an apple every day. There was an uh, exhibition space. The exhibition space was linked with the archive. I wanted to show about the life of Antonio Gramsci and in this space were documents and photos uh, about Antonio Gramsci. These were lent uh, from the Instituto, Fondazione Instituto Gramsci in Rome. And there were personal belongings he had actually in prison of Antonio Gramsci, who was lent by Casa Gramsci in Gilerza in Sardinia, where is the Gramsci house. So I wanted with these personal belongings, I wanted to create a, a direct uh, connection with the eventual visitors. And there was a film made in 1977 called an Italian film uh, 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 called um, Prison Days, Antonio Gramsci Prison Days. It was made by Lino Del Fra and this film was here uh, visible. There was also a daily rose uh, there were 77 roses for the 77 uh, days of the Gramsci monument. We constructed an internet corner, and it has an own space in the internet corner where 10 uh, computers with printers and uh, for free access and every day a lot of mostly kids where they and enjoying to go in online. There was a radio station, a low power radio station um, uh, in one of the of the pavilions. There's Phil Bader, he's a New Yorker, actually uh, somebody who who does radio, who in his past did radio, and every day there was uh, the radio 
the radio was also did also streamed uh, on the internet site the um, the lecture we had uh, uh, the discussion we organized this is a local resident dj baby d who took over together with uh, phil bader uh, the radio and organized uh, here interviews and interventions of residents or visitors. This is another DJ of the neighborhood it's called DJ Gucci, who uh, made this together with um, Baby D. Then there was a bar called the Gramsci Bar. The Gramsci Bar is an important place. It's a, a strategical place. Five uh, residents uh, were the people who organized uh, the bar and ran the bar all the time. Uh, the bar is not only important to drink or to eat, but it's also a place to be, to meet, um, and to hang out. And uh, the five residents did uh, made their small business uh, with very low prices in the Gramsci bar. I have to do it very, very slow. <laughs> so, mm. so um, another element, another element of the presence was uh, the banners I wanted surrounding in the neighborhood have some banners with quotes of Gramsci. One of the quotes I like a lot, every human being is an intellectual, links me also to the artist I love, Joseph Beuys, who said every human being is an artist. The neighborhood in forest houses is half half, half Latino and half African American. That's why some of the banners were in Spanish. So this is presence production. I organized then two kinds of events daily events and weekly events. The daily event were event, they were organized every day. For example, the presence of the ambassador. I already told this is the ambassador. On the left, Yasmil Raymond. Yasmil Raymond was the ambassador of the Gramsci monument. Her task was to meet other ambassadors. Actually, here is the general consul of Switzerland, because I'm Swiss, who came to the Gramsci Monument. So he had to welcome our ambassador. The ambassador has an own, had an own space. The task, the, the most important task of the ambassador was to explain, not the Gramsci Monument, but to explain art, culture, to the residents. I wanted that somebody is around at the Gramsci monument who uh, knows much more about me than me about art and culture. And this was the task of uh, Yasmil. Yasmil is also the curator of the Gramsci monument. She wanted absolutely be the ambassador. And I was happy that she wanted to be and be uh, it was also a very good that Yasmil <coughs> speaks Spanish because a lot of people could dialogue with her in, in her and her or his mother language. Yasmil also, the ambassador, went to the field trips. We did every week. I come back to this later. Here, the field trip of United Nations headquarters. Yasmil, the ambassador, also helped in the, for the newspaper, the daily newspaper we did. And she had an ambassador's note. She wrote almost all days a note in the newspaper. 
about some ha something happened today, a reflection she had about the Gramsci monument. I was very happy that Yasmil, this curator, took over this task, this double task, ambassador and curator. And I can tell you as an artist, it's not often the case that you can work with a curator who is not only behind you, but beside you in all of the problems, in all of the difficulties, but also in all of the beauties who arise with a project like this. Every day was also the children class. This is Lex Brown. She's a young American artist. I met her in Princeton when I gave a lecture and she wanted to do something once with me. So I invited her to come to do a daily program at the Gramsci Monument. And Lex did the children class every morning and in every afternoon the kids from the neighborhood or other kids came and she made an art class with them. She based it always on a very structured idea and tried to work together with uh, the kids a, a thematic, a daily thematic. Sometimes there were more kids, sometimes there were less kids. And of course, there were often all the same kids because in the summertime, not all of the inhabitants go to holidays. This is some of the productions they made in this children's class. And to me, for in the Gramsci monument, it was like every day the starter of the monument, the presence of Lex with the kids. Lex proposed a very creative and also a very, um, very um, thoughtful program to the kids. <coughs> this is the children's class. Then we had daily a newspaper, the Gramsci Monument newspaper. This is on the left side, La Kesha and Chequan, two residents. La Kesha and Chequan uh, were the, the directors of the newspaper, the ambassador, myself, I helped, but they did the daily newspaper. It was printed 100 or 300 examples, three, between 100 and 300 examples, photocopied, and uh, it was hanged out or diffused on the site. The content was something in relation to a visitor, in relation to Gramsci, in relation to the neighborhood, to forest houses. There was inside every day the daily lecture of Marcus, the philosopher. There was something inside about Gramsci every day. There was a feedback. We get a lot of feedback, internet, but also newspaper feedback. And there was other contributions. And the last page was the resident of the day, 77 uh, residents had a picture of them in, as a resident of the day. And as another um, daily event was the website. The website was daily uh, uploaded, unloaded with new material. We arrived with new photos about what happened. This was my personal assistant from Paris, Roman Lopez, who did this every day. Then I organized weekly events. Weekly events are events, they are 11 times because the Gramsci monument was 11 weeks. So for example, every Monday or every Tuesday, every Monday there was the Gramsci theater. I asked Markus Steinweg, my friend, to write a piece about Gramsci. And this was the Gramsci Theater. The Gramsci Theater was played every Monday 
Actually, it was not really a play. It was mere, a, more a lecture. It was a convincing lecturing. I tried to direct 11 residents when it was raining or when it was sunshine. There are here the actors. My idea was to give uh, the text of Gramsci or the discussion surrounding Gramsci, Gramsci in dialogue with other philosophers, a corpus. And of course, I hoped also that uh, this was one of my ideas to implant the name and the ideas of Gramsci into the brain of the participants. Uh, every Tuesday, there was a poetry lecture. To me, poetry is important because I really believe that poetry can help us to stand up in this very complex world. So I invited poets every week, a poet. This was a local poet, Nina Heden. This was another local poet, Mar Marcella Paradise. I mean, local, really, residents of forest houses. Sara Gambito came, Elena Rivera, Latasha Nevada Dix, Greg Tate, Edwin Torres, and also he made after uh, a small workshop in the in the in the in the workshop space, Fred Moten, Oquien Vesor. Oquien Vesor is also curator, but I invited him because he started with poetry. That's why I invited Oquien Vesor. And of course, he knows the Bronx. Robin Kelly and Tonya Foster, who also made a uh, a workshop, Christopher Stackhouse, and uh, Tra Tracy Morris. Wednesday, we organized what I call the running event. The running event was something I didn't, I couldn't organize before because I didn't know. So uh, sometimes with the help of Eric, sometimes with the help of another resident, we organized round ta table discussions here with the Central Park Five. Somebody came and wanted to do um, um, here, a dance performance. It was Foster to all from cold to all from us. Marcella, the poet of the neighborhood, made a storytelling. She made it twice, storytelling one, storytelling two. Henry Grimes came. Glenn Ligon, this was actually, Glenn Ligon is a, an artist, an American artist, and he he was a formal resident of forest houses. Until 13 years, he lived in forest houses, and then they moved in another uh, part of the city. So he came back through the Gramsci monument to make a lecture about his work in forest houses. This was Greg Tate, who came again and proposed um, something, then the forest houses, steppers, how they call them. Uh, I invited also uh, a, an artist colleague um, to come to make a lecture about um, Gramsci, because he knows Gramsci very well, Alfredo Jarre. He made a work about, and he came and did it. And 
This is Peter Warne, a resident who came a lot of times, who was very truthful and proposed a lot of these running events uh, in, integrated into the Gramsci monument. Every Thursday we went out, the idea was, I already told you, the ambassador together with an inhabitant, we made field trips to bring out uh, the residents who wanted uh, to go out here. This was the first, was a visit in Dia Beacon, then a visit in a library. Everybody could take a book. Um, we made a trip to the New York Times and had a meeting there with a journalist uh, to a taxi, to a, a taxi office or somebody who works with taxis in order. Always the idea was to bring kind of other reality to show uh, the people who wanted to go to the field trip another reality. This was an NBC or a television station. The people who wanted to go to a, a farm a biological farm. There was uh, a field trip out to the Socrates Sculpture Park with the uh, Bronx bronzes of John Ahern and um, Freddie Velez, one uh, resident, organized a small tournament, baseball tournament, in order to find out the winners of it and then they could go to a um, a game, a Yankee game to the Yankee Stadium which was not far away. We went also to uh, a post office to speak with how, how it works, a post office. We went to the United Nation, uh, uh, I already mentioned, uh, to visit the exhibition there. And uh, we went, to, of course, to the Bronx Museum, which is 10 minutes away to visit the exhibition there, and at least we went again to the DIA uh, to see the broken kilometer downtown. Uh, every Friday I organized what I call Art School. It's based on Energy Yes, Quality No. It's, a, um, it's something I already did. Uh, but uh, I never did it integrated in a work of mine and also in um, a project with in a in a project with residents and actually this was to me I think really uh, interesting uh, because there was a real mix of people who who came to this art class who showed their work not their artwork just something they did. This was the, the rule, to show, so, to do something, and then to show it, to share it with the others. And we discussed, does this own energy, yes or no? We didn't judge, or we didn't look, does it own um, quality? And this was, I think, quite uh, uh, interesting, because there was a good mixture of three, four residents and other people who come uh, from downtown or other parts of the city. When we discussed then together always, uh, does the work presented or whatever what presented owns energy and of course why? Sometimes there was more people. I started with only two people and then there was three people next week and then more and more people came. And what we did is always this kind of uh, list or kind of uh, program. Uh, everybody uh, needed to, uh, to fix uh, their judgment. Yes or no does the work we discuss owns energy. What I wanted with this, to have it visible that what is important is not unanimity. What is important is disagreement and to stand out the disagreement. That's why I insisted so much that we had, we made always this list and, uh, and wrote down our judgment. 
And actually, really, there are not a lot of unanimity into the whole um, result of the, uh, this workshop. Uh, Saturday then, there was a seminar. I organized a seminar about Gramsci because I wanted to learn about Gramsci. I wanted to be the first who wants to learn about the life and about uh, the work of Gramsci. So Simon Critchley came, Marcus Green, Stanley Aronowitz, sometimes with very different points of view, John Chiarada, Rupert Sims, Joseph Buttigieg, which is a, uh, who, who published two biographies about uh, Gramsci, Walter Adamson, Gayatri Spivak, Chris, and Christine Bucci Glucksmann, David Forkas, and Nadia Urbinati, and for the end, Frank Wilderson. I learned a lot about Gramsci myself, and I'm very privileged that I could go to all of, of the lecture. And actually, as um, a weekly event, there was the last things, the last thing we organized, uh, like to chill out in the end of the week. It was called the open microphone. Everybody could come and everybody could produce or declare or declaim what, what he or she wanted. I think I forget something before. It's the daily lecture of Marcus. Because, of course, my friend Marcus Steinweg, he was there every day with the ambassador, with Roman Lopez, who was in charge of the website, and with me. And Marcus did every day a lecture, the same hour every day on another thematic. He made 77 philosophical lectures. Sometimes a lot of people came, sometimes a very few people came, but Mark, there was no, no day, nobody there, and Marcus did what I'm very interested in, did create his own audience. To me, the proof that philosophy can be shared by everybody. One of the most beautiful moments, I got a lot of beautiful moments, was when one of the residents here asked Marcus about his position to religion. Because the pe per persons here, um, they're going a lot of, to church. Uh, every, it's a very important issue. The, church, to go to church. Uh, and Marcus always explained in the lectures his point of view that, that God is dead. And there was a question about, from one of the residents about why um, he insists so much about, of course, that uh, uh, God is dead after Nietzsche. And in a beautiful explication, beautiful explication, Marcus Steinweg, as a philosopher, told to the people there that as a philosopher, he needs this completely freedom to think without God, without a frontier, without somebody who put an interdiction. And the people there understood it and came again. There was no I mean, you must understand this gap between a kind of somebody who every day goes, or every, not every day, every Sunday goes to this ritual of the church, and then Marcus with his very clear and very sharp uh, uh, affirmation of the death of God. And this was a beautiful moment um, that there is a possibility to exchange, not to agree, of course, but to exchange about something. And I think the answer of Marcus was beautiful because, of course, as a philosopher or as an artist, you cannot 
have a, a, a limit or a, a, a frontier or have somebody who, uh, who decide for you to do something or not to do it. And I think the resident who asked this understood it. Sometimes it was raining and we just put the uh, tarp on the scene. So this I forget because Marcus was a daily, the daily event. So I told you about the daily events, the weekly events. And uh, of course, uh, the Gramsci monument, I already mentioned it. It was an accumulation of errors and lacks mistakes, but I learned to hold them out, to, to, to stand and to agree with them, because I always thought I want to do a work where errors and lacks are not important, or a work which is more important than the errors and the lacks who it is inside. So after the 77 days, together with, again, 15, the 15, the same people of the construction, we dismantled it, the Gramsci monument, very quickly in eight days, eight, nine days, everything was properly dismantled and the space was left like it was when I came there. And uh, the last day, uh, I organized what I call a free raffle. Uh, every material, every software, or I mean the computers, the 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 ACs, every material, uh, I wanted to give back in a way to the neighborhood in a free raffle for everybody. So we organized uh, um, for everybody uh, that he, he could be a winner, even when it's only a tape of ta tape, a roll of tape. Um, Eric did a great work and helped us. And in four and a half hours, everything from the neighborhood, uh, what was integrated in the Gramsci monument went back. So as I, as I told you to me, the Gramsci monument is cannot go into the categories in a category of failure or in the category of success. To me, it was um, a true um, experience. Um, and uh, to me, it was only possible because there was a love, love to the people of the neighborhood, to the people of forest houses, to these people who in their dignity, but also in their openness, in their understanding, in their, in their patience, in their, in their uh, understanding of art and philosophy, uh, was to me a very encouraging lecture about how art today can play a role in our world today. Uh, and this is what's about and this is what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you. Um, could you say a little bit about the way you choose to uh, construct things, the gaffer tape and packing tape and plywood and every very visible and very rapidly put together things? 
the, the significance of that? I mean, I, I always work with these kind of materials, tape, wood, photocopies, cardboard. There's materials I, I decided to work with, even also when I do an exhibition in a gallery or in a museum. So they are my materials. So actually, this is a very important point because I can prove to the residents that I always work with these materials. I love these materials. I'm committed to these materials because they are precarious, because they have no blue value. So they are materials, they are not intimidating. So this is a political statement. I can prove that I not only do work with tape, <laughs> cardboard, and wood because it's forest houses. I do it also in a gallery or in an exhibition space or in a museum. So it's a very important point. And people, I mean, this is not the first discussion I have with the people, but then they could see it. And this is important, of course, to me as an artist to be truthful to my materials. I think in art, the question of material is still an important question because it had to do with the position you have as an artist, where, why you work with these kind of materials and not with other ones. And when I think, when I say I love these materials, of, no, of course, I hope not in a selfish love, but because I decided to work with this material. I'm committed with it. And I know there are a lot of, also, after critics to stand out when I decide to work with tape, with cardboard, with photocopies, etc. But it's a real commitment. That's why also in forest houses I work with these materials. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> I wanted to thank you for such a, a generous and earnest lecture. And I wanted to ask, um, often with participatory work, there's a challenge to ensure participation. Um, and all of the pictures seem to be very well attended. And I wondered how you were able to do that from what seemed like the first day. Oh, and that's, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not agree with you. Because I mean, your question is right, but I try to show that it is not well attended all the time. Um, this must be, for example, the daily lectures here. <laughs> that was not well attended. Uh, I mean, there was lectures well attended, but other like this, but others not well attended. For example, uh, here. I showed it, not before. So it's very important. Yeah, no, I try it to, to show that it's not only well attended. When I showed you, uh, for example, the art school, it started here. This was the first three pictures, you know, with two, three people, you see? Um, so it's not very well. It was not well attended. So I try it first. I'm a little bit astonished, but I have perhaps to make, make it even clearer. But I really try not to show only the well attended, because of course you're right. There are, there are um, lectures, there are much more attended, or production much more attended. For example, um, uh, the, the seminar of Gayatri Spivak was very well attended because uh, the whole crew, or not the whole, but a lot of people from, uh, from uh, Columbia University came. <laughs> okay. But also, I must say, uh, for example, uh, uh, when there was a running event with uh, Peter Wayne, uh, the singer, the local singer, it was quite well attended because they know him, Peter because he was a resident of Forest House. But you know, the question of attendance is, of course, a very important question. But I really try it not to focus on it, but, um, but to focus it on presence and production. That's why it's not, a part, it's not called participation, presence and production. Because me, I can be there. Me, I can produce something. And, uh, of course, after uh, it's difficult uh, to share it with you, with pictures, 
to show what happened, which kind of public was here, etc., and, and who was there, and how many per persons was there. But I, I tried to be more or less um, uh, not too subjective. Um, you've spoken a little bit previously about making art politically and the difference between making political art and making art politically. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yes, uh, yes. Look, for example, for example, there really a concrete example here um, in the running events, in the running events and also um, in the open microphone. There was an open microphone. And uh, the, open, the microphone was there. So the people came from the neighborhood, not from the neighborhood, but from um, politicians came, local politicians, and wanted, or also uh, politicians, for example, from Occupy Wall Street. And they wanted to, they wanted to, to speak. And I said, no. No, it's not possible, because um, you cannot, you cannot take, you cannot take the microphone uh, for uh, uh, to make your propaganda here. It's not an open forum. It's something we did together, and there must be uh, there must be a, an agreement why you uh, are speaking here. Not because you want to be elected, for example, that uh, you can. So I must be that what I think working politically, that is politically, uh, that means I was the guardian of my work. And I tried to be the guardian of my work. And actually, I had, I don't know where is the person who asked me, I had a, a beautiful, there was another beautiful moment. Here, the man in the, this was the seminar of Frank Wilderson, the last of the Gramscian. The man in the, in the front is the now major of New York City, uh, de Blasio, and his son on, on the right side. He, he didn't ask, he just came to listen, because he understood that what I do is an artwork here. He came to listen because, of course, he was interested in the, the, the thematic of, of Frank Wilderson, a very political thematic. But he came just to listen. You know, so somebody understood, and I must say, not like, for example, the other politicians who came and wanted to uh, and, uh, uh, and criticized, criticized me because they say, yeah, but Gramsci was uh, a political Theoretian. So I told them, yes, but this here is an artwork. So, you know, this was the complexity, but this was also where I think I must be very clear as an artist what it means working politically and make my work political. And this was, I, 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 try, to, I try to give you um, an answer in a kind of uh, uh, pictures, with pictures, how I think how I think it works. So I had to fight for the integrity of my work as an artwork, but also, of course, I was happy when somebody understood there is in the artwork something who is fucking political. And this is how uh, a few, on a few moments, in a few moments, I told you the other one with Marcus and with the question about religion, I could say these are forms or I think uh, it's about working politically and not do a political work. Um, Tom, us. I, so maybe it's connected with what you just said then, but the, the background or the location to all your monuments have been public housing. It's poor people. Now, would it become a political work if you positioned it in an area of private rich housing? Yeah, you know, I am not, I'm an artist. That, what means this? Um, I, ass I assert things. I assert a form. 
Everything I do is an assertion. It's based, it's not an argument. It's not an argument, it's very important. It's not an argument, you know, it's an assertion. You can say, somebody can say, it doesn't count. It doesn't work, but it's an assertion, very important. So I, when I do my work in how, you, uh, you, in neighborhoods as you described for poor people, this is a part of the assertion of my work. It's very important. So I'm not the whom, that's why I say I'm an artist. I'm not the whom who make a demonstration how it will be differently perhaps in another neighborhood. This is not my work. This is not an artwork, you know. This is a work perhaps of an uh, anthropologist or, I don't know, somebody who makes a statistic. I'm not interested in this. That's why the location is so important. So you know, the Gramsci monument. Why? I mean, I was invited to do a, 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 a work in public space. So of course, the public space is big in New York City. As always, there is the High Line, there is the park in front of the City Hall, there is the Park Avenue, there is the Rockefeller Center. They're all public spaces. So there are a lot of already artists who does works there. So they do also their commitment when they do their work in Rockefeller Plaza. So this is also a statement. So my statement. To do it in forest houses in South Bronx is also a statement. But I'm not the who who want to manipulate or want to make an argumentation with the places where I put them or make a demonstration in putting on different, uh, on different locations. Why I do it there? Because it's much more fun. <laughs> because the people are open to it. And also because the experience I think I could do there is, is the, who, the, the experience I'm really interested in, where things are shared, shared, really shared in a kind uh, of uh, um, in, the, in the kind of confrontation in a reality where you have really not to be disappointed by this. All right, I accept that. And I know you're sincere in everything you say, but a cynic might say, not me, but a cynic might say that these events, though there's nothing to sell, these act as something to back up your marketability for products for rich people. And so the poor people provide a background and a color to give sincerity and authenticity to your work, which is sold to rich people in high class galleries. A cynic might say. Yes, I mean, I don't know, I don't think you are cynic, but you know, this is not the problem. This is not my problem. This is not my problem. It's, uh, you know, when you go to forest houses, you don't come to tell them, uh, I am an artist who shows in a museum, or I have also a gallery uh, uh, downtown uh, who sells my work because this is just not important for the people there. It's just not working like this. You have a project, you want to do the project, and all informations after you may, may somebody can have actually. And here I'm speaking not in the point of view of the art world, but in the point of view of the, the, the person in the, on the ground, the residents. They are very happy that I also do my work in other locations, and even that I can sell it. This is very important. It has to do with, you know, to reach something, to reach something what others, and that I told you, what, what you think, what others, what you think, that cynical thinks it's not possible. That's why I told you also in the beginning, I learned what it means when people come and say, uh, I am skeptical, or I'm critical, or I have doubts. A lot of people came with this. I have doubts, I'm critical, I'm skeptical. What means this today? That nobody anymore has, you know, or not mo nobody, but a lot of people today are, are neutralized. There has no more, 
the imagination that perhaps through art, what I do, what I believe on, what is my word, that through art you can establish a dialogue with somebody without the question of rich people, poor people, without the question of do I sell my work, is it not sold, etc., etc. Just because I'm an artist, I do my artwork. And this is what I'm interested in. And that's why I'm doing there. And that's why I have these kind of dialogues. And it has nothing to do with sincerity. It's not about sincerity. To me, it's not a sincerity. It's about what do you believe? That's why I, I tried in the beginning to speak a little bit about art and about the mission I had. Tom, it's got everything to do with sincerity because your sincerity is what makes those people do that. And I'm sorry, there are other questions. Uh, there is the last question, actually, please. Hi. Um, every, every time I see the nature of the materials that you use in your work, um, takes me to think to the aesthetics of protest and how um, actually disagreement is performed. No? I was thinking in the occupations that went on in the public spaces of m all most of the European cities as well as well, what it can be called the Arab Spring and how also the Occupy movement in, in the States and how they were using the space to actually perform a disagreement in a different way that it was used before. And I wonder if it, that has influence, I mean, if it does is present somehow of if you've been influenced by that, by the events that of the occupation of the squares that happened from 2011. Okay, uh, yeah, just for uh, Duncan, I will meet him after for a drink and we can start, we can continue to, to discuss the question just that it is not cut like this. No, uh, your question is, <laughs> I influenced them. Think this, think this. I influence them, not the contrary. Mm. I influence How? them. Think this. Yeah, think this. It's just, uh, uh, I propose you to think this. I propose you to think this. Um, I, I'm thinking it, but um, <laughs> could, you, um, could you explain this a bit further? No, you know. Uh, no, no. For example, uh, when I started to work, as an artist, I, 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 I defined who counts for me in art. That's, for example, the French artist Robert Filiou. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. You know, who, were, who made work with cardboard and stuff like this. It has nothing to do with protestation. But, you know, um, I made this, this decision to work with this kind of aesthetic before Occupy Wall Street, sorry. <laughs> and I must say, in a way, imagine that I think I must recuperate what they took from me. And this is how I see it. But also, I would like to say here something. Why? Why then? Why then, when you're working with materials and the aesthetic I work with since years, why? Why this is uh, why this determines for you uh, this kind of uh, provenance of protesters? That's the question I have. I have to you. Well, and I'm sure when you go in a museum exhibition today or in a gallery, uh, not often, not often, not always, but not too often you think uh, the contrary on the material pro they propose there. You, know? you, must, you must say the, pro the decision for, as I ex tried to explain before, the decision for a material is a very important decision. And it cannot be only to use the aesthetic of the others. It cannot be based on it. It has to do with love, to to these materials, and perhaps also with love to the artist who used these materials in the past. That's why I use it. I cannot, I can only say I, I and then of course I, I, t I see what happened. But should I change now? Should I work now with a video, only video projectors, or should I work only with steel or uh, with gold and silver and 
other materials, plaster, because the Occupy people use cardboard and wood and, uh, and tires, etc. That's the question. No, no, please don't do it. I mean, don't, don't change. <laughs> it was, uh, the question was um, more about how actually these uh, spaces are used, no? These uh, spaces that are public spaces are retaken. And I think, I mean, that, that was the connection, more than the aesthetics, no? That of course, there is a precarity in the aesthetics of disagreement because it's, it's usually fast, and usually the ones who complain are the ones who have less resources as well, no? But um, for me, it was more about the fact of understanding that um, public space as a communal space that needs to be retake, retaken, no? reconquered somehow. No? And um, so my question was kind of addressing more that than actually the, the aesthetics of, um, because I, I think there has been a change on the way we understand protests since 2010. Um, and yeah, that, that, yeah, that was that. What I think, what I can learn, what we can learn from these manifestations is uh, the, the part of the presence, the critic of the representative democratic through presence, through pu pure presence, you know, which is very well critiqued because why, uh, what do you do now? Now, first to be present, just this presence as a human body, as a human resistance, as a, uh, an entity, an entity, as this I think is uh, what I think makes this unique, makes this new, this presence with the body, with to be there with the body and not to be represented by somebody else. And this is, I agree with you, uh, it has nothing to do with the aesthetic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.